Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blue Star Rising, the Templar Awakening. Michael Henry Dunn here with the one and only Reverend Maya Nortumid. Hello, Maya. How are you today? Hello. Doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> doing fine. I <laughs> doesn't say it with as much conviction as you usually do. Let's just say <laughs> you are surrounded by the all-healing light, which carries you through everything that the divine puts in front of you in a given day, right? Absolutely. And I've got a whole quantum cube logic double terminal in here and, and my, uh, you know, my capsule necklace. And I've got cats around me, which are very healing. So that ought to do it. Wow. It sounds like you're covered. I mean, you know, I, I got my shungai. Right? There's, a, there's a capsule down there, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, hello, everybody. So this is really interesting show. I mean, I always say that because it's always true. But um, the Lady of Light and the highly compelling but mysterious connection to Atlantis along the time-space continuum and the question of how the higher codes of that which was best and highest in the original Atlantean encoding, the original divine blueprint of what Atlantis was supposed to be, if it hadn't been for those darn Nephilim and their genetic messing about. Gosh, those Nephilim. Anyway, um, I mean, I'm, I'm being somewhat whimsical about it, but um, it's a coherent picture that emerges, you know, when we trace the entirety of what you shared, Maya, from the concept of there having been a planet, Atlantis, in the system of the Blue Star Rigel in the constellation Orion, that it had a similar story arc of, um, of a tainting and um, of its divine design and a uh, cataclysm. And the the sort of transference, you might say, of the planetary consciousness and and destiny of, of those souls to what then arose on Earth as the continent and civilization of Atlantis. And, and, and again, the divine design was messed with. And the consequences were the time tsunami that consumed Atlantis some 13,000 years ago. And the really amazingly specific science that you share in the video we're going to see was really compelling to me that um, that there was a realization um, on the part of certain high sacred scientists in Atlantis towards the last couple of hundred years when before the time tsunami when they knew what was coming they knew the consequences were looming of, of what had been done, uh, specifically the DNA, um, well, the, the interference, the, um, the dark faction, the Nephilim interference um, had degraded the light codes of Atlantis such that uh, the, the catastrophe was looming at that point and that this idea, now let's see, you know, cause I always try to see if I can express it um, in my own language in such a way that can open the door for our viewers. The idea that they realize that the very best of Atlantis could be preserved. Atlantis herself could not be saved. The, they realized in the, in the process of what you share with us here, that the consequences were going to come they could not be avoided, that Atlantis would fall, but that the light encodings, what you refer to as the, the pictographs um, on the level of consciousness could actually be saved, preserved, and transmitted if a corresponding point of light in a future time-space path forward, a timeline, could be located such that these encodings could be at a very precise moment, <laughs> at the very last moment, actually 
transmitted along a time-space continuum and that that light point in the future space and time from which these sacred scientists in Atlantis were projecting towards happens to be the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. And the fascinating thing, one of the many fascinating things about this that you bring out to me um, is that the souls who were in place to create the Statue of Liberty, which was of course a gift from the nation of France to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the United States in 1876, were guided, these were the same souls reincarnating from Atlantis to accomplish this purpose, and guided by the same higher council of light beings um, who had guided the original divine blueprint of Atlantis, and that those souls are incarnate now. Who knows, you know, maybe some of them are watching. Maybe some of them are, are part of our circle. Who knows, those are God's mystery that uh, God likes to keep us unaware of the parts we played before so that we don't get distracted from the parts we got to play now. Yeah, right. yeah. so, um, you know, and that similarly, you know, you point out how the United States of America was another divine blueprint. And with all its imperfections, when you strip all that away and get to the essence, there was a, you know, divine blueprint of, uh, of divine liberty, divine freedom, human evolution towards complete freedom. You know, as, as Christ says, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And, you know, on the highest level of those words. And then once again, that divine blueprint has been tainted, has been interfered with by iconic forces, Nephilim, um, factions to their agenda. You know, so when the United States Air Force bombs Syria out of the blue, violating all international law, as we just did, and people say, oh, well, this is your sacred United States that's doing this. They said, well, this is the military industrial complex, which is controlled by the, you know, corrupt elite financial faction, which has co-opted American democracy quite some time ago, such that, yeah, okay, is that the essence of the divine blueprint of the United States of America as conceived by those founding souls? No, this is the highly compromised version that we're dealing with. And we are looking at the possibility of the dissolution, the breaking up, it seems, um, of the original union. And what is held out here, and this is what's so inspiring to me, is that whatever transformation is coming our way in terms of what the United States of America goes through, becomes, breaks down, reassembles, that there is the very high likelihood and, and possibility in the time space continuum right now that a higher expression of that original divine blueprint will emerge when the dust settles. Would that be an accurate way of putting it? Yes, yes, indeed. And you know, um, both was speaking to me about uh, some of this, not the Statue of Liberty part, but as far back as 1976, I recall, it was a centennial or something, wasn't it? Centennial or oh, something? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, you know, all the tall ships in New York Harbor. and Yeah, yeah. So he brought Iowa. that up to me. He brought that up to me at the time. Something about that, you know, that it was a destined da-da and it would, you know, continue despite, and he said certain things about it. Yeah. That yeah, I mean, it, it is, if you've ever been there, and I know you have, it, it's, to me, it's sort of like the Taj Mahal where it's one of the most famous structures in the world. Everybody's seen a million pictures of it. Oh yeah, the Statue of Liberty. Just like with the Taj Mahal, if you are in the presence of yeah. the Taj Mahal, if you go to Agra, you doesn't matter how many pictures you've seen, it is breathtaking. Yeah. Reality yeah. of that perfection, 
and the sheer scale of it, the perfection of it on a massive scale is breathtaking. It, it, it's, it's quite breathtaking. And similarly with the, with the Statue of Liberty, you know, to approach it on the ferry boat, you know, from the battery down there at the southern tip of Manhattan, you know, it's very difficult not to be deeply moved by it her is. presence, by her presence. As you say, you whatever. Feel that you literally feel it. It's more than, wow, that's a nice big statue. It's, it's like you feel the presence, which was notable to me since I received the message before, I, shortly before I went there. But I must also add, when I went to Giza, same thing, you know, uh, we got there at night and I was so tired. I couldn't hold my eyes open. I, Simeon just went like this and I went <clears throat> in bed. <laughs> it was like I was out. So it was night. I didn't get to see anything. I, I get wake up in the morning, like kind of groggy. Simeon's already been up and, and I'm going to the curtains because they're closed. And I said, and I'm opening the curtains. And I'm saying, where's the pyramids? And he says, look up. And I go, Oh my God. <laughs> I'll never forget that yeah. moment. Because, you know, there was trees and everything in the, in the courtyard of the hotel, you know, and I'm, I'm going like this. And then he says, look up and, and it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's, let's get to the video so we can talk a little All right. bit more. Well, about yeah, I mean, um, is there anything else to say before we. No, I, I think I think you're right. This is a, a good time to just share it. Let's roll forward with it. So. Um, it is quite compelling. Don't change your channel. Don't take <laughs> the pizza out of the oven. The cup of coffee can wait. This is it. Don't go surfing elsewhere. The destiny of America is coming your way. So <laughs> with that, uh, please enjoy this about 20 minute video on the Lady of Light and we'll be right back with you. On the night of April 3rd, 1998, I saw clearly in my mind's eye the Statue of Liberty against the night sky. In her uplifted hand, at the top of the torch she holds, was a brilliant sphere of light, resembling a blue-white star. There was a fine beam of white light emanating from the heavens above the statue, which culminated in the brilliant sphere of light above the torch. I was startled to see this vision, especially since I had no thoughts whatsoever concerning the Statue of Liberty. Thoth immediately opened the scroll for me, whereby I was able to see and understand the essence of this vision. Following is what I received from Thoth the next morning in this regard. Within the Statue of Liberty resides a being whom we call the Lady of Light. This is an aspect of the Divine Feminine which is embodied in an ancient archetypal form. Within this particular point upon the planet where the Statue of Liberty is situated, she holds a divine ordinance maintained by those souls we refer to as the Towers of Light. These are the souls who carried out the development of the United States of America as a destined program of light which was given forth by that branch of the cosmic hierarchy which we call here the Council of Liberty. The Lady of Light radiates a pulsing charge from the magnetic containment field formed by the Statue of Liberty. This pulsing beacon serves as a manifest signal of her presence, which then alerts otherworldly realms that spiritual liberty abides there. As imperfect as the United States may be, it was originally created through divine ordinance and when all else is stripped away, that intention is revealed. Now let me take you through the folds of time to a point of light in the history of the nation of Atlantis. 
In the final few hundred years before the concluding cataclysm which destroyed what remained of that continent and nation, the scientists of Atlantis in the temple complex of Ahura, which was located in the region where the Bimini Islands are now, began to send and search for signals through the time portals. This is much like current-day scientists are doing in sending and searching for signals in outer space. The purpose of the Atlantean scientists was to locate a frequency source in another time zone, but still within their own electromagnetic banding that was highly evolved. In other words, they were to locate a banding which was composed of what they called formalized wave structure, a type of energy patterning that is largely metatronic and crystic. If they could find such a specific energy source and could lock onto it in the form of a finely developed tractor beam, they felt they could possibly recreate their reality to exclude the detrimental factors such as mutated DNA, which were destroying their light focus on the planet. There were two main projects underway in this regard. They began with much the same purpose, but became quite different before it was over. Project A was known as the Serpent Brand. Its focus was on the Great Pyramid in the City of the Lords on Mars, the Sidonia region, which contains the key programs for the Telesakara, a capstone on the tear in the universal fabric of space-time. These Atlantean scientists felt that if they could find a way into this energetic system, they could possibly reprogram planetary history, at least at certain key points. The other endeavor, Project B, which was named the Winged Serpent, was intent on searching the Earth grid throughout its own timeline, following Atlantis' own electromagnetic thread into the past and future in order to locate an energy source point which would allow them to anchor onto and rotate certain key timelines, which would then reconfigure aspects of the then-current Atlantean reality. Such topics are difficult to fully explain in a brief summary, thus we shall not attempt to do so, but instead will give you a glimpse of the essential science involved. This latter configuration, engendered by the Winged Serpent Project, is somewhat like creating coordinates with which to find an unknown point in space. A further step would be then to redefine the space between the coordinates and the now known point to which they all align. Soon after the Winged Serpent Project began, those involved began to see the folly of their intentions. Not only were they tampering with the destinies of their own time frame, but the destinies of those realities which would build upon their current existence as the future of the Earth unfolded upon the event horizon. The primary questions which arose in their minds were, what mortal mind could encompass all the implications of the mutability of time in the laws of cause and effect? And further, what soul could take such responsibility upon himself with absolute integrity and wisdom? Thus, winged serpent was transformed into what could be translated into your current syntax as Project Clarion. A new format was envisioned. The scientists of Clarion called upon what might be referred to today as shamans, which were from various territories of Atlantis. The shamans were adept at other world travel through parallel realities, other dimensions, and time zones. However, these shamans only viewed and spiritually interacted with these places for the knowledge that could be gleaned. They did not attempt to affect them in any way. The clarion scientists wished to combine the natural powers of these shamans with their own scientific knowledge. In order to locate an energy source in the future upon their own electromagnetic banding that contained a specific formalized wave structure, Project Clarion's goal in this regard was not as it had been under the Winged Serpent Project. They were no longer intent on redefining timelines to alter their own reality. 
Instead, they accepted that Atlantis would perish as a result of its repeated decisions in the past which had not been aligned to spirit. They were given insight by the shamans they enlisted, which indicated that the final demise of the motherland of Atlantis would occur as the result of the manipulations the serpent brand proposed as the solution. The shamans told them the destructive force would be in the form of a time tsunami. In other words, they would eventually create a paradox rift in their own time field. The shamans, however, also saw the potential to recover the finer qualities of Atlantis as a spiritual nation which it had been in the beginning and of which a portion still remained. As Project Clarion scientists perceived it, this recovery would have to occur in the future at some point. They devised a plan whereby they would begin by attaching an interdimensional energy beam to a specific energy source which contained the spiritualized codes inherent within the highest principles of Atlantis and some suitable future energy point in space-time. This lifeline between Atlantean time and future time would then need to remain constant until just before the end. At the decided moment when the time tsunami was upon the earth, Project Clarion would release the lifeline in a specific manner so that it used the open-ended time rupture of the tsunami to create a containment field. At that point, holographic energy light forms or pictographs could then be placed within the containment field and fed through the future source point which Project Clarion had anchored their grid to. These light pictographs would then be accessible for infusion into various matter forms throughout the future world by the inhabitants of that time-space reality, many of which would be the same souls that incarnate in Atlantis working under Project Clarion. It was surmised that these light pictographs could then be infused into various locations in the future reality, whereby they would begin to form a specific language of light in that future reality along the same electromagnetic path in which the pure consciousness of the Atlantean motherland had existed. The spiritual development of planetary evolution, which was contained within the potential of Atlantis, but which was cut short by the Nephilimic intrusion, could then resurface through both new and ancient modalities in a future age. In order to achieve this anticipated result, Project Clarion had to construct a large device in the form of a building which is somewhat comparable to an atomic accelerator, although in detail it was quite different. Essentially, this device created a separate reality zone, a kind of sterile environment which was removed from the absolute time mark of current linear time in Atlantis, and yet in this instance was still within the same electromagnetic zone. Since many sacred structures were contained within reality spheres somewhat separate from the outer world, this in itself was not too difficult to create in that age. However, there were some distinct differences. Project Clarion had to build this device so that it would only lock onto specific wave structures amid the multitude of waveforms within the various space-time frames of its electromagnetic zone. The key words here are lock onto. Finding these targets would be much easier than having an energy interaction with them. Thus, Clarion needed to create a means to narrow the spectrum of the signal they were sending so that it matched the energy source with which they wished to interact. Many complications arose because these signals contain a different energy bonding dynamic within each given moment in time, and this difference is gradually accelerating through linear time. The first step was to define the frequency and vibration of the target 
energy source beforehand. Thus, they must locate and choose a target and study its patterns. Then they would go about creating the appropriate tractor beam. When Clarion located the Lady of Light in the Statue of Liberty, they knew that they had found the ideal source. It was a tall, energetically conductive metal at a key point on the earth grid within the same electromagnetic zone as Atlantis. It contained an entity consciousness of high spiritual ordinance which was sending a repetitive signal intended to form anchoring patterns of light about it for the purpose of location and interaction with other realms. This too seemed perfect. But the shamans involved with Project Clarion pointed out to the scientists that the soul, souls incarnated in this future time who were responsible for the creation and placement of the statue were among the same souls which now compose Project Clarion and that the spiritual hierarchy which opened the statue energetically for the Lady of Light to enter was the same one that had overseen both the ancient planet of Atlantis their current nation of Atlantis, and subsequently their own Project Clarion. Project Clarion was successful in their endeavor. Although Atlantis met her fate, her spiritualized mind was transferred with her last breathing and thinking moment into the keeping of the Lady of Light. The date this transfer was made in current Earth time was April 3rd, 1998. This is the night that I, Maya, saw it occur. This date was very carefully chosen by the shamans of Project Clarion, who would all reincarnate within the Mayan order of Orachalipi, meaning bright star. This order would carry on the Project Clarion plan through their knowledge of time, space, astrology, and astronomy. Understand that what we are defining in this transmission as the light consciousness of Atlantis goes back in time much further than the continent and nation of Atlantis, all the way to the world of Atlantis, which was once one of the planets of the star Rigel in Orion. And so now in February of 2021, I look back on this and I see the relevance to our current situation in time and space, and that especially of the United States of America. But first, I'd like to mention that this article, which I just read to you, including the transmission from Thoth, was given before, just before our sacred journey conducted through the uh, overlighting of Thoth to, um, to Great Britain. We went to Glastonbury and Stonehenge, and uh, but and also Scotland. We went into Scotland. So um, there were other locations as well, also some in Spain and France, but primarily it was in uh, Scotland and England. But we were stopping first at the Statue of Liberty, and I think I don't can't remember exactly because it was a long time ago, but I might have been that um, we stopped there on our way, you know, as the plane landed in New York uh, to go there specifically because I had received this message, but I'm not sure about that. In any case, we did go. And we were also given sort of a mission to accomplish connecting to the Lady of Light. I won't go into all of that. That was in the past and part of our journey then. But I do want to read you just the part where I talk about how I was, what I felt when I was there at the Statue of Liberty. Not only myself, but the others that were present. We were emotionally taken by the power and majesty of the light which emanated from the Statue of Liberty. I felt an overwhelming wave of emotion crest upon the shores of my heart when I first embraced her full on, looking into her face and the torch she holds for humanity, the torch of liberty and freedom for all. 
Due to time constraints, we did not ascend the spiral staircase to the top of her crown, but had ample communion with the Lady of Light from the top of the pedestal upon which she assumes her sacred dominion upon the earth. And so now, in 2021, it seems as if our country is breaking apart. And what would follow in a historical um, timeline of, of countries breaking apart, of creating some fine or, or beautiful vision for themselves and embarking upon that path with great sincerity and purpose. And then it crumbles. It crumbles because the arconic energy, the Nephilimic arconic, attaches itself to human beings who uh, have a different agenda. And they come into that realm and they decide that they want their agenda to uh, steer the ship. And that is what happens. And then that civilization crumbles. That great dream dies once again. So... Is that going to happen again? Perhaps. But I am receiving from Thoth that in this instance, it's going to transform. That the towers of light, as he talks about, those who established the doctrines and brought uh, the United States of America into a divine as, um, resonance with a true vision, this time, this time, that vision will remain, but perhaps not all the outer trappings of it. So we're going to be faced with great change in this country. There will be a lot of dissolution, but the, the divine doctrine that, that brought it into fruition in the beginning of this country, I am receiving from Thoth will remain, at least for a long time yet, and until its purpose is finished. But it will look differently in many ways. At first, those ways may be extremely challenging, but they will settle upon the earth as sort of as a light fairy dust, and we will be able to breathe that in, uh, humanity at that time, and accept a new, more natural way of expressing what this country was founded upon. In conclusion, Thoth shows us, reveals to us, this connection to Atlantis, and the connection is strong. We have the old Atlantean uh, ones who were very arconically invested, which are with us again, and we have the Atlantean ones who strove for a better world and saw the light beyond the tunnel. They're all with us now, not all of them, but I mean there's a mixture of those souls with us now in the United States and in other countries. But right now we're focusing on this country of the United States. And we see that they are very present with us now. And their masks are coming off. And they are revealed more who they are and what their purposes are. So that tractor beam from Atlantis that is focusing into the Statue of Liberty, that beam is helping to guide us from the past into the future. All right, welcome back. So this moment in time that connects back to that moment in time the light codes of the best of Atlantis that seem to be anchored in the Lady of Light, in the Statue of Liberty. You know, the question arises and you frame it right there at the end. You know, mm -hmm. how does this move forward? How can we help this best of the higher light codes to, to manifest? Uh, what comes up for me uh, to ask you about uh, and see what the Thothic stream brings in. When we talk about the transformation potential that is in the field, we can see how far the actual, you know, actions, manifestations of 
the United States of America as a political entity. Um, you know, many would say what we're actually seeing on the global stage are the actions of the U USA Incorporated and that the organic republic of the United States of America as, you know, conceived in 1776 and 1789 with the Constitution was put into a coma um, shortly after the Civil War when the corporate entities and agenda essentially co-opted the organic republic. That's a whole other topic, but it, it, it does address the point you bring up about the, what we call the, the Nephilim interference in, in the divine design and blueprint of, of America. I think often in this regard of George Washington's vision that he had at Valley Forge, and it's quite specific actually now that we mention it, where in the depths of this horrible hardship, this horrible ordeal, you know, in the bitter cold with little food, supplies not forthcoming, Congress unable to send them money, you know, if we can survive the winter, the United States will still exist because the Continental Army will still exist if we can survive the winter. He receives this vision of, of this angelic woman of light appears to him. Lady of light. The lady yeah. of light appears to him and says, son, son of the Republic, look and learn. And she shows him this vision, you know, first of this, you know, this the dark cloud of, of slavery overcoming the union and there being the, a vision of the civil war and then America emerging again. Um, and then prefiguring the world wars and then a final full on invasion of America was shown to him. But after a time of terrible darkness, the light emerges again. And each time she said, son of the Republic, look again and learn. So I think of that you know, blueprint, what's, what's happening today. And we look at the possibility, which really for the first time since the civil war is being talked about, you know, bandied about when people talk about, um, a breakup of the union. People are talking about, you know, secession in tones that, okay, the state of Texas trots out an annual resolution. Shall the state of Texas remain in this union or not? We all say aye. We're just, yep, we're going to stay in one more year. <laughs> they really we do that. We can opt out if we want to because we're from Texas, right? Okay. Oh, I know you're from Texas. Where are you from, Arkansas? Oh, I, I lived in Texas. Let's not say I grew up in Texas. We I love our Texans. I, you know, I have a lot of good yeah. Texas friends. I, I, I actually I, love the spirit of Texas. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a whole question about whether they actually could see that it was kind of settled at the cost of 600,000 lives. Uh, so, yeah. but anyway, yeah. but it is now, you know, when we look at the, the tensions um, in, in the country that could possibly result in, in some kind of, a breakup, division, dissolution, a reforming after, you know, as you said in the video, we see this a lot in history where, I mean, a beautiful idea is brought forward. It takes shape. It's inspiring. And then all the little ankle biters start to um, do their thing. Yeah. And if I can say something here. Please go ahead. Um, okay. What was it? Ankle biters. I re okay, I remember. Yeah, ankle biters, right? <laughs> that put the fear of God into me. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Anyway, anyway, um, yeah. So we already have faced a resurrection, a resurrection, insurrection. <laughs> not yet, not the resurrection, but an insurrection on the and the core of democracy in the capital. And I know people can smirk that, that a lot of negative things go in there, and they do. But again, that's not what it was founded on. That building literally, literally vibrates with the presence of the Holy Accord, but it's been crusted and crusted over with a lot of stuff. You know, the stuff is breaking up. So uh, we see this insurrection, not as a good thing by any means. It's the, it's the beginning of the end of something. But when it ends, there's something else. 
And that's something else preserves what the vision of George Washington gave him, what the Lady of Light gave him, what the founding fathers gave us. And I know the founding fathers were not perfect, but we have to see them in light of the age in which they lived. So okay. in any case, here we are. And one of the things that I, this, I finally remember what I was going to say. I, was, I thought if I talked long enough, <laughs> I remember it. Um, it. That, you know, we are living in what Thoth calls an oratronic reality. That's half light. Half light is not bad, but half light is not complete. And when, ha it's, when you have a environment that is not complete, there's where the ankle biters can come in because there's a vacuum, there's a vacancy, there's a, a sense of, you know, um, ignorance, uh, unknowing, because we've only got half of the equation. So these other sludges come in to say, well, we'll fill that slot for you. Look over here. This is the truth over here. And we go, because we're only half light. We go, oh, really? Okay. You know, it's like some of us do anyway. And so that's the, the, the draw, because the draw is to fill the cup. And if the cup is half empty, we want it full. So we're looking, we, the humanity, is always looking for a way to fill it. But the way to fill it is through absolute spiritual heart resonance contact. And that brings you up into the Metatronic, the full light spectrum. And then there's nothing, there's no f empty spaces to fill. It's all filled with this glorious light love experience. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to experience in this time, on, on, in world system one, as Floth calls it, the full light spectrum and its complete glorious, uh, you know, resurrection. Uh, we're going to experience that in New Earth Star, that's world system too. However, we have the ability to start filling that cup, to start bringing the level up to a certain degree. And once we do, the heart starts activating with it. So um, that's where we are right now, is we're seeing that we can no longer just slosh around with a half empty cup. We're going to have to start filling it in preparation for what comes next. But in that preparation, we become more wise. We become more knowing. We become more satisfied. Dissatisfaction is what is causing what's going on in this country right now. Of course, the dissatisfaction is coming from a whole lot of political stuff that went, came way before DT, but DT filled that slot just beautifully to carry it forward. We also see the two sides of the equation, the old guard that's, you know, the old elites and whatever, they're struggling to hold on, but it's breaking up. And a lot of those old guards that were what folks called soft elites, like our current president, are beginning to go, well, wait a minute, I don't have that monkey on my back quite as much as I did before, and I've always really wanted to do good. <laughs> Now, the heart elites say, eh, no, I've never wanted to do good, you know. So we have that little wiggle room there. It's not going to solve our problem, but it's helping us out a little bit while we solve other problems. Because the new guard, which is a lot nastier than the old guard and a lot more prepared and a lot younger and a lot spiffier, they're, you know, they're playing their hand. They played it when they got DT in, and they're going to continue to play it with the Q and all of that. However, because there's wiggle room now, because some of the soft elite are going, oh, well, maybe, maybe it won't hurt if I help a little bit, you know, that's giving a space for the inner light network to work in. But understand that the inner light network are not going to be like Teddy Roosevelt coming down the charge of the, uh, uh, the hill. Yeah, said, yeah, right. Uh, because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> they are going to help us help ourselves. And that is a, not a short path. It's not an easy fix. We created a long wave of slide down the slope. And so we can't just go, ooh, and we're out of it. We're gonna have to move ourselves out of it. And we're gonna get help or we'd never make it. But we have, to, we have to put our energy into it in whatever way we feel appropriate not in a way that's going to be violent or, you know, cussing people out or anything like that, but on a spiritual level and also on a physical, energetic level of high quality frequency. 
you know, not getting down there in the lows with them. And, you know, people have made fun of, uh, um, okay, now I can't think of her name, Barack Obama's wife. That'll be Michelle Obama. That would be Michelle. I knew her name all the way along until right now. <laughs> anyway, Michelle saying, when they go low, we go high. Well, you know, I, I agree with that. Uh, but, you know, you have to look at the situation. You have to address it. But then you look for the high road. Because the high road is not going, oh, well, I just won't think about it. It's not like that. It's about thinking about it on a level of experience and, and, uh, and uh, quality vibration, again, frequency, that just by thinking about it on that level helps to, to break up the old patterning on the planet, if enough of us thought in that vibration. And so when we see the Lady of Light holding up her torch, you know, she's, she's guiding us to lift that torch in our own hearts and, and souls and, and to respond accordingly. Yes, when you're, you're, you're talking about the Inner Light Network um, doing its role behind the scenes, it is behind the scenes. As you say, it's not, you know, the big rescue and the cavalry charge. It's, it creates the room for us to be able to do our part in healing and, and restoration. And, you know, I, I like to say the, the, the ILN, the Inner Light Network, you know, doesn't get the kind of glamour press that, the dark faction gets, you know, ooh, the Illuminati, and then there's the P2 Lodge, and then there's this dark society and that, and this is, yeah, okay. Well, they screw up a lot. They're operating according to a completely inaccurate model of the universe and how it works. And, uh, you know, they get glamorized, you know, by their own press. Because exactly the more, right, because the more they can get people to believe that there is some all powerful dominant faction behind the scenes of everything. And that we're all mere puppets on their strings. Well, the easier it is for them. In fact, of course, they're fighting with each other. Um, uh, you know, the, the European dark factions are fighting with Russia. Russia's watching China. China's got its own agenda. Then there's all the off planet factions and who's allied with whom and all that's, it's a very complex picture. And, you know, the, the so-called, uh, Illuminati and oh, you know, whatever the name is. Uh, Anunnaki, you know, they're, they're claim to Anunnaki ancestry, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm, it's so boring at this point, uh, you know, because, yeah, it, it, you know, it's like, folks, just we need to remember that there is also the infiltrated alliance of light quietly humbly but powerfully doing their work also infiltrated at the highest levels of government finance all of it agro military industrial all of it there are high souls also in place to nudge things quietly one way or the other to make possible um the room for us to exercise our free will and it as you say maya you know it's Staying aware, but not getting dragged down. Coming, yes. being in the high light frequency, being aware of what's going on. Don't we can't bury our heads in the sand? That that doesn't work either. Um, and each of us has to find our own path, our own lighted path of what your unique dharma, your path of righteousness is, your duty. Your, you know, it might simply be founding a local organization to lessen the suffering of animals or, um, you know, any, any number of things that you're called oh, to. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? Okay. And, and each to pursue our own spiritual path of contemplation, meditation, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I look at what's coming and like well, what's happening right now, you know, with uh, the new administration, um, they are doing the usual symbolic gestures designed to make everybody feel good. Like, oh, wow, we have a Native American woman as the Secretary of the Interior. Now, that's a big deal. 
personally, I think that's a big, a really it's big a deal. Very big deal. It yeah, is, you know, because that's a very huge chunk of not just America's karma, but you know, the whole colonization, um, genocide karma that this country has to deal with. Um, I mean, you know, a good first step would be for Pope Francis to repeal the um, doctrine of whatever it was, the, the, uh, the papal bull, the famous doctrine of, uh, that allowed them to just confiscate um, tribal lands because they were regarded as yeah. discovery, oh. doctrine of discovery. Um, that would be a good first step. But, yeah. you know, oh. so there, there are these symbolic gestures. And then, you know, and then they go and bomb Syria. You know, it's like, oh, look at the pretty, you know, we have the liberals are in charge, and isn't it sweet, and we're compassionate, and, we that, and now we're going to go bomb Syria. You know, blatant violation of international law, trumped up excuse about, oh, well, they were cooperating with Iran, and we just needed to destroy a few buildings and kill a few innocent people. Sorry, it's just collateral damage. It happens all the time. Sorry. You know, this is that, you know, huge moral um, horror, gap, blindness, whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, and it's just about, hey, guess who's back in charge? The people who, you know, come up with wars in order to up the profit of the military industrial complex. We're back in charge now. So here it comes. Well, and, you know, uh, but the thing is that that's not holding anymore. I mean, they, you know, there's, there's a bipartisan backlash in Congress already against yes, this. There is. And, um, my God, Bernie Sanders was is in a position of power, not a huge, but you know, but he's there and he's in a certain position of influence. And Joe is listening to him. He's not doing yeah, well, we'll see. You know, it's it's going to be really interesting these next four years, to say the least. Yeah, it sure yeah. is. Because, Especially um, CPEC thing. Oh yeah, because you know, Biden is not a young, vital, energetic man. No, oh, no, he's <laughs> never a man of huge accomplishments, and he's a man who's got a lot of moral compromises in his background. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the whole question of, you know, what, uh, what unfolds, what he attempts to implement, what the puppeteers above him, hey, we're back in power, now we're going to go back to the old agenda, you know, and of course, the whole question of uh, well, the vaccine and how, how it's being used and the yeah. control agenda behind that, you know, it's, yeah, exactly it's going to be a bumpy ride. I think by the time we get to 2024, we will see emerging the the patterns of the dissolution and rebirth that you're describing. Do you get that sense? Oh, uh, yes. I, it's, it's happening very quickly. And it'll be kind of scary because it's always scary when you have to turn loose of something, even if it's this body that you have to turn loose of before you go into a much better place. Even, you know, it's like anything you have to turn loose of that you've had for a while and you have your little securities in it, it's going to be scary but it already is scary. But you know, um, it's been long overdue. And if it had happened earlier, it wouldn't be so scary. <laughs> there wouldn't be so much momentum of, you know, the sludge coming out of the woodwork as, as there is now. But you know, that's just how it is. And, and we have the responsibility not to shrink in the sight of it, but to stand tall and to uh, focus on, as Thoth calls it, the light not in the tunnel, not at the end of the tunnel, but the light beyond the tunnel. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was very specific from him, you know, not just the light at the end of the tunnel, but the light beyond the tunnel. Right, the because there's always the possibility that the light at the end of the tunnel is the train. Light approach yeah. of the train. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Oh, right. It's the light. Well, there, and, and, you know, um, Thoth is telling me right now. Ah, scoop <laughs> that quite a few I don't know what he means by that I can't number it it just said more than just a few uh, of the soft elite right now and some of them aren't famous like Joe and Obama but this the soft elite are being contacted energetically spiritually now I don't mean that they're having oh my God epiphanies there's the Lady of Light standing in front of me. Don't mean that dramatic, but nevertheless, surely there's an energy that's able to reach them now. And the reason is they've these soft elites have been really wanting to be on the right side, but they got themselves entangled so long ago 
and they have so it's like you know with a loan shark you know once a loan shark gets hold of you, you can't say well i'm not going to pay you that money anymore I mean, it's like <laughs> you better you know you like so, retaining the use of your fingers yes yeah. exactly so they have been so you know co-opted for so long they've tried to do little good things you know obama tried to do a few little good things when he was there and he did but you know the big things you know, he had to sign the papers he had to do because he, gun was at his head. Uh, I'm not giving an excuse for that. You know, there's always a way to deal with these things, but, and they didn't. But the point is now they know that the old guard is breaking up. Now they know there's something out there. They're not, you know, that's not good either, but they're not a part of that yet. And they don't quite know what it is. We assume that all these people know about what they're doing, but really there's only a tiny little group at the top that know what's going on. The others are either totally subsumed by greed and fear, or they are wanting to do good and they wanted to do good for a long time, but they're subsumed by fear <laughs> and not necessarily greed, just the fear and their families and their safety and everything. And like, how do I entangle myself? So now, according to what Thoth is telling me, because there's this breakup, they're getting a little like, oh, well, maybe, maybe I can do some good, something. I have to be careful, but maybe I can. But while they're opening up on that level, there's, a there's, a, there's an energy contact that's being made with them universally, not some being standing before them or anything. And so certain ones, and the guy in the White House right now is included, are beginning to get that signal. And of course, a lot of them are older. And if they're good, basically good people in the first place, you know, you get older, I can tell you this, you start thinking, well, you know, what are the things I did I shouldn't have done? And, and should I, you know, I need to look at that. I need to be more honest with myself. And what can I do better and good now in my final years? So, uh, that is what is taking place in some ways. Now, that doesn't mean that Biden's going to turn into Santa Claus because he's still got some monkeys on his back. But the monkeys are kind of like, uh, well, they're, you know, beginning they're to distracted. stay. Yeah. Right. Got yeah. So, so there's an interesting play of balance there. And uh, I just heard that Biden has made a very decisive speech. He's standing up for the unions in a really powerful way. I listened to that speech and I was blown away. And I listened to alternative um, uh, news. I can't even think of the guy's name. He's got beautiful uh, brown hair. <laughs> That's how you think of his name. Anyway, he's a really, I like him. He's very balanced and he talks about things on all sides. And he said, well, I've been proven wrong. I could have sworn that Biden would have stood up for Amazon because he's got ties with Amazon and all those biggies. He said, I'm just blown away. Now, will he be able to pull it off? That's another question, and that's what he said too. But yeah, said, I mean, all, this time, all this time in the history of democracy or whatever, this young man who's very knowledgeable, I'm not, but he, I trust him, and he said, there's never been a president that stood up in the way Joe Biden just did. Now, will he follow through is another question, but that is historic. Yeah, I mean, you know, Joe Biden's always talking about, I'm from Scranton, you know, I'm from working class. Well, you know, that's the unions. And the unions have been crippled in this country, starting with, you know, Ronald Reagan breaking the air traffic controllers union. Um, I mean, I, I knew when that happened, oh, man, never was a more justified strike than that one. And the fact that he broke that union. Um, and of course, this is the former president of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan, supposed mm -hmm. labor champion. Yeah. So, you know, the speeches are cheap. We'll see what happens because what we are dealing with is the fact that the president can make a speech and he can outline an agenda and he can set his aides to work on making proposals, you know, to Congress. Um, and Congress is still controlled by the, the corporate, you know, funders, mm -hmm. campaign contributions, um, you know, you you have the Supreme Court decision that greatly empowered, you know, corporate campaign contributions. Um, you know, there's the Princeton bipartisan study from some years ago that concluded that the United States is not a democracy and has not been for some time. It's a plutocracy and that the will of the people 
has a negligible impact, mm -hmm. negligible impact on actual legislation. It's, mm -hmm. it's the wealthy. That's, you know, so Joe, Joe Biden can make a speech about the unions and that's great. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, it's something. It is. And that's all yeah. I'm saying. And that's all this yeah. I'm saying. It was, it's historic. It's not happened before. And I watched the speech. I listened to him, that little part of the speech. And I, you know, I consider myself somewhat sensitive. And right. I didn't that he was just putting on. He meant what he said. Now he's getting pressure from, from the, the growing populace of the uh, liberals, the, the, the progressives, sorry, the progressives. Uh, but he's the one that put Bernie in that slot. So, you know, um, one way or the other, the, this, this, this status quo is starting to crumble. Not yeah. just because Joe, but I mean the whole picture. And so Joe's kind of leaning into that crumble. Um, so, but let's get to the bigger picture for a moment. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this because I have to be careful. Uh, there are certain things that Thoth does not want me to speak about publicly over the airwaves. So I'm trying to word it in a way with his guidance that I don't do that. And I've got a big mouth. <laughs> so, you do, unfortunately. I do my best to watch it, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so... He's shown me something uh, last summer uh, that was really totally took me by surprise. I had no inkling of it. And this is something that the, the new guard has been uh, working with for a while. And they have these individuals that they have been raising. Um, to be able to perform somewhat supernatural tasks. And I'm not talking about leaping from tall buildings. We're not going there. <laughs> but, you know, uh, especially sharp. <laughs> and theirs, all theirs, raised from little chickens, <laughs> you know. And so, uh, but what happened, what's happening, is that tide is beginning to turn because there's enough human in them that some of the more advanced souls are able to enter these incarnations. Mm -hmm. And so they're having a little problem with that. And that is where the inner light network, certain higher grade versions of the inner light network are helping some few of these that are not going along with the old guard imprint to get away. And so mm -hmm. now they have a little enclave, the Inner Light Network does, of these very special people. It's small, but it doesn't take too many of them. <laughs> I'm not, there's a lot more I'd love to share with you, but I can't right now. But I, just I think it, we did go into this a little bit in a previous program. Oh, maybe we um, did. These individuals are rather tall and rather pale, as I understand it, right? Well, maybe I gave away the story after all. As they say, loose lips sink ships. <laughs> loose lips sink ships. Well, you did a whole program on it, I think, and and. Um, oh gosh, really? Didn't interfere, didn't you? Ah, am okay. I am I spelled ship now? Okay, never mind. <laughs> well, the maybe this thirty seconds will be erased from this tape. You did not hear <laughs> what you just heard. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the bare outlines of the story are really enough. It's meant to encourage us. The fact that you felt guided to share what you have shared, that you know that there are again, it's it's evidence that you know this supposed all powerful secret world government um, is not a world government. They're fighting each other. There's factions fighting each other, and they're not all powerful. Sometimes they're all stupid. You know, they they a lot of their plans go awry, as do the plans of the higher, as well, because of course they have to deal with the interference. But uh, I think we're justified in saying that it's going well. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm an optimist by nature, and I'm always trying to look at it as going well. Yeah. But you know, in terms of timelines that could have happened by now. They have been avoided 
you know, back in 2012, a pretty dark timeline was avoided. Yes. Feels like in the last few months, several dark timelines that a lot of us had very good reason to be quite concerned about, saw them starting to play out in front of our eyes, have been avoided. And so I'm very encouraged. I'm, I'm inspired. I'm optimistic. Uh, I look at what's happening not only globally, but, but locally. I look at local movements that I'm aware of here, citizens coming together regardless of political affiliation to take care of each other, um, you know, to allow, to increase our, our freedom to be what, you know, America was supposed to be. Hey, it's free enterprise and, and freedom of religion and freedom of thought and freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Uh, all these things that are getting squashed with, you know, the current control agenda going on. But it's noteworthy, so Michael, it's noteworthy that we still have enough democracy in the high courts that were elected by you know who to uh, say, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to do this just because you want us to and you put us in power. Yeah, that was, um, you know, it, it to some extent restored a little bit, you know, the faith in the Supreme Court that was lost in Bush versus Gore when the Supreme Court voted along party lines of who had put them in mm -hmm. to stop the counting of votes, to stop the counting of votes, which is what democracy is supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, lo and behold, I mean, that was the whole strategy with DT was, you know, it was going to be the judicial stopgap, you know, the judges. And that's why it was so important to get that last Republican judge in there in time so that, you know, well, well, so that she would do what she was supposed to do, and none of them did. And, uh, you know, you, you can go on and on about, okay, you know, um, how, how true and fair were the elections, et cetera, et cetera. But the agenda that we were flatly assured multiple times, oh, don't worry. Yeah, you know, Biden supposedly won the election a few days after the election day. But don't worry, the Pennsylvania case, oops, the yeah, Texas yeah. case, oops, you know, yeah. oh no, the Supreme Court, oops, oh wait, the electors on the 14th, they're going to get together, we're going to, no, no, ah, January 6th, that's the day. And well, even then, with that total fiasco, January 20th, the, you know, the, oh, we got a new date, we huh? got a new date, Michael, March 4th. March 4th, uh, is going to be, you know, DT is going to really be president then. Because, right. and so what? The, the, when we see uh, Joe enter the White House, it's really a movie set. Yeah, it's a movie set. Uh, <laughs> I know. And they faked the moon landing, too. Yeah, so yeah. Well, let's, let, let, let's, I can't say that anymore. Let's get, <laughs> let's get, let's get somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because the, first, the thing is, many conspiracy theories are true. Yes, exactly. And a lot of them are true, believe me. And yeah. then there's all the BS that is the disinformation psyop meant to co completely discredit the truth movement and completely discredit the revelations of the real conspiracies that have been going on for centuries yeah. with things like well, yeah. Q and, yeah. and March 4th, which, you know, I don't know how many deadlines that they all get excited and completely well, believing in. Yes. They come and go and come and go and they still still believe in the next one. So anyway, Mark the last thing I heard, we were saying that uh, let's hope they push it out a little further because if they decide, if they're saying these guys, these Q people are saying, if this doesn't work, we're going to create a, a full out war. And they mean Right. It. Well, you know, a lot of that, I mean, we need to remember when you read stuff like that online, mm -hmm. um, there are people who believe that. And then there are people in basements in office buildings, in various places around the world, on their laptops, paid professional trolls whose job it is Stir to it create disinformation to, I mean, and this is documented stuff. If you want to go to Edward Snowden, if you want to, you know, this is, you know, a law was passed in Congress to allow propaganda by the United States government to deceive the American people. Okay? So, and then there's other factions that work in there. Whose interest is it in to create a whole movement that radicalizes, you know, the those seeking the truth 
and creates what happened on January 6th. Who benefited? Yeah. So the, the, we thing, of it, the thing of it is getting back to the high road, you know, with the quantum cube logica project, and I'm not going to go all into that because we've, we've done a show on it and most people listening to this, a lot of them know what that is. But the quantum cube logica project that Thoth gave me in the with regard to the to in to integrating the 9010 technology out of Germany with the uh, Hierophia cube in the inner earth and the beings, including Thoth, that are working on this project, which he calls the Hi Fi team. Uh, and incidentally, one of those is the soul of, of Nikola Tesla. Actually, he's the one that's in the lead. Thoth is overseeing a lot, but you know, that's the one that's really operating it. I know it sounds pretty. Looney Tunes, if you just say it out loud, and when I say it out loud, I almost want to go like this because, it, you know, so many things are being said. But anyway, I got to say it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I couldn't have possibly known some of the things that I was told about this had no inkling until I found it on the Internet later. And that's how it happens so much with me. That's why I call yeah. it divine Google because I don't know Jack Cheese about any of it. Jack Cheese. Jack Cheese. I have to remember that yeah. one because I and, used to say the other. And so, uh, then, myself, but you fun. know, then it, it, it turns out to be true. And this thing with Tesla, there was a whole bunch of stuff you told me. Found right, Tesla Paresis. It's just a, Tesla, Tesla Paresis. What's that? And you look it up and lo and behold, it's a well, I wasn't highly given, arcane scientific term. Yeah, I was given the fact that it existed and what it did, which is Tesla-Phoresis. And they said that Tesla, who was in the inner earth, was when he was on the surface, he was the one that developed it on the surface in a particular way, but it was not anywhere near as advanced as it was with the Tesla in the inner earth working with it. Then I go up and I find Tesla-Phoresis accidentally, I wasn't looking for it, and it is what he invented. He this comes out of what he invented, but people are just finding out that it can do that. This, this Tesla coil. They didn't know it could do it. Well, of course, Tesla knew it could do it. And so there it is. It's, and he, when I described it, it was exactly, exactly what Thoth was talking about, only they've got it down much better. So anyway, back to this object and the connection with it. So we're doing this work where the energies, the codes that are coming out of the, the cube, that's really just a, a centralized station for many codes coming from different directions, but it's coming out of the center of the earth. It's, it's allowing Gaia to speak because she's been cut off, not entirely, but you know, to a degree from her surface self with all of this electrical stuff going on and all kinds of things. So this is one of the paths. I'm sure there are others he said that people are working on. This is a very unique path, though. It hasn't been done by anybody else so far. To give Gaia internally her sacred sun Atoma, that is the intelligence center of the planet, and an outlet to be able to broadcast. We can broadcast through these quantum cubes into the world. And um, this technology is not foo-foo stuff. Not only does those say it's 100%, um, you know, there's been tests, there's been people's experiences, uh, all kinds of things to back it up. Um, so anyway, the fact is, obviously, I'm very involved in it. And I feel like, because all of these years, I brought all of this stuff through, and I've tried to find a way to utilize it. And I have, you know, to an extent, but I never could find a real way. Now I've got physical objects that create quantum fields that are proven devices. And that is how I bring all this 55 years worth of stuff into the, the, the quantum cube logic of project and being able to broadcast these codes, these symbols, these activational formats that I received 40 years ago that are germane to now. So that's why I'm so excited about it. But anyway, um, so that brings me up to, um, I had another video that I made very quickly this morning that we, I was thinking of putting in the show, but no, we just don't have time for two of them. So I'm going, you will find a link to both the insert video of the Lady of the Light and this other one, which I'm packaging together in a little format. So you can have their separate videos, but you know, like in a little showcase. And you can click on that link and you can see the second video as well as if you want to watch the first one again. Second one is about 18 minutes or something. And I will give you a preview of what it's about. 
last night, well, this morning, early this morning, uh, <laughs> the cat started barfing on the bed and I woke up. <laughs> it was a divine barf. <laughs> the off. cat was yeah. divinely guided to barf to wake you up. Right. And I got her off just in time. And then I was awake. And so I lay back down and all of a sudden I started getting all this stuff because right now we're broadcasting the, uh, to connect to Ruta, the Ascended Ruta. It's one of the, we're, we're, being, we're being guided to broadcast, not to send them stuff. It's like this part of the broadcasting is to connect. We're connecting to different nodes all over the planet. We've got longitudes and latitudes from different locations that we're putting in the cube that lines. Of course, there's no longitude or latitude for Ruta, but we have a special symbol and, you know, we're connecting it because it's very important. Okay. So last night, Thoth said, you know that pylon of Melchizedek? On, in the temple of the northern door at Ruta? And I said, yeah. And he said, that is sending, now able to send signals directly to the Lady of Light in the Statue of Liberty. And I went, oh my God. And I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. But, you know, oh gosh, I've excited Alexa back there. So anyway, I made this video, <laughs> even though I was half asleep while I did it. And um, it, it talks about that, you know, it, information I wrote back in 1990 something, 1991 to two, about the pylon. And I bring it up and then I show how it's connecting to the Lady of the Light in this field of consciousness that's connecting. Well, what was going on last night? We were told to broadcast to Ruta. And that's when I woke up, it was like the broadcasting was just, you know, filling my mm. space and Ruta was everywhere. And that's when I received this information. Well, and Ruta. if I may, just to, to yeah. quickly thumbnail for everyone, you know, for those who may not have heard some of Maya's previous material on this, um, the island of, of Ruta was a, a physical island, part of the Atlantean nation which the physical version of it, yes, was you know immersed in the time tsunami, but the actual Ruta in its all its manifestations ascended, which is to say it still exists essentially in the same place in a slightly altered dimension, similar to the way in which the new of the inner earth is at a slightly altered dimension. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes, it would. And in the video that uh, I'm talking about, you'll get more information on exactly, you know, the science and dynamics of that. Although I don't go into great detail about Ruta, my main topic is about this pylon and about Melchizedek himself, mm -hmm. and what that relationship is. So um, I think it's a really powerful video, but it was just too much to add. To yeah. So Ruta you know, still exists. It's still a a remnant of the, the highest manifestation of what Atlantis was meant to be is still existing um, in a slightly removed dimension. Would that be an accurate way of yes. saying? Yes, it would. And, and the, the, what it's, it's doing- It's in the Atlantic Ocean. It's, uh, yes, it's operation now. See, they didn't know they were gonna, this is the, the kicker here. <laughs> they didn't know they were gonna ascend. It happened out of a natural circumstance, as I explained on the video. It's almost like a little bubble went because, you know, when everything went, it went <laughs> because uh -huh. it was a natural expression of the fact that they had developed such a high frequency on that island. That that's what happened when the tsunami hit, because it was not a regular tsunami. We're talking about what Thoth calls a time tsunami. And that's what it did. It brought the highest element up and the lowest element down. So it's, then they were going, what happened? What happened? Where are we? <laughs> it's almost like a comedy show. No, we're but, not in Kansas anymore. Right. And, the, and yeah. it worked itself out. The ultra beings came into the scene. They were able to do that, like both, whatever, straighten things out. And they said, okay. It even caught the ultras off, the, the masters off guard. It's like, oh, wow, look what happened. But they understood it intrinsically immediately. So they took advantage of it. And they said, we know what this is for. This is to help guide these timelines back into synchronization with what both calls the Rana time wave, which we've discussed on the show, which is not a, not a uh, line. It's a wave. It's a waveform, and timelines follow the waveform. 
but when they get bumped out a little bit, you know, they're not really in sync. And that's where we are right now. What Foth calls the Kali Rift. So, um, so this, this Rudin thing is uh, helping now to resort that out. Well, what were the Atlanteans doing? They were doing that in a way as well, the good Atlanteans, you know, trying to broadcast their signals of, uh, that, that could be preserved for the future to help garner all of this energy. So the two are a match set, Mr. Melchizedek and Lady Lot. <laughs> it's a perfect wedding. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Mr. Melchizedek. Mel, we call him. His pals, we call him Mel. Oh, Mel. <laughs> all right. You know. Um, <laughs> your pardon. Lord Melchizedek, I'm an entertainer. Um, so the transmission of the higher codes of what, of the best of Atlantis put forward along a timeline, a you know, time-space continuum to find that electromagnetic bandwidth or whatever you want to call it that would connect in the right place in time Turns out to be the Lady of Light, turns out to be the Statue of Liberty, turns out to seemingly use as a transmitting station, the Ascended Isle of Ruta, which is even now, as we speak, transmitting those codes into the Statue of Liberty. Is that right? Yes. Um, let's put it this way. The Lady of Light already has some pretty nifty pictographs in there, some co codes, but the Melchizedek energy, not well, let's not say that, the Rudin energy using the Melchizedek pylon, uh, what they are doing is, is like taking off the blindfold. They're saying we can translate the pictographs into the, hmm. the larger consciousness of the planet. And of course, there's the, the, the Dion couplet, which is that, um, well, the whole Dion uh, grid, which is between the planet Earth and the ion ionosphere, I can never say that word, ionosphere. And it's invisible, of course, but there it is, and it's very active. And um, I have a whole video on that, but it has hard and soft faces to the geometry of it. And he says that we couldn't be talking today with vowels and consonants if we didn't have the Dion broadcasting, because these hard and soft faces form the language. Uh -huh. And they don't, does a lot more than that, but that's one of the things it does. Now, the hard and soft faces and the combination of energies and the way it's, it's organized its language, because it's broadcasting a language of, of sacred geometry. Um, that is what one of the main things we're working with with the quantum cube logica is to allow those, that language to start speaking on the planet. And of course, the, lang the Lady of Light's holding the Atlantean pictographs. What are pictographs? So the, the, the practical effects of this, in terms of the consciousness of human beings around the planet, as these energies, these thought forms, these pictographs are translated, transmitted, is going to manifest how? It's going to manifest by allowing people to open up their chakras, especially their throat chakra. Uh, I'm not just saying so they can talk a lot, <laughs> but that, that this whole energy system that's in the body has to be expanded and opened up. And all the yoga in the world, the meditation, and I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying it's not going to cut it right now. We've got to have a little more than that. It has to open up from these, these language systemic systemic forms that are coming out of the Dion and what Thoth calls the Dion couplet, which allows the signals to do what it does. Now, Ruta is idyllically positioned on the, on the, what Thoth calls the lip of the eye of Ra. That's going off into, I know, hyperspace. Eye of Ra is the universal tear and Ruta is like on the lip of that. I'm not talking about space, okay? I'm talking about energy. And so they can literally bring through the, the, the high universal original creational signals and wed them with the pictographs and the Lady of Light, get that frequency going, and we have the Dion couplet and what it's doing there. It's such a big picture. I, I tried to talk about it, it sounds like gibberish, but it's just, it's a sequence of things that all can line up together. And once it does, we suddenly are, you know, able 
to see what's right in front of us that we can't see. And once we are given the knowledge through our own senses, those that can see, unfortunately, there will be those that can't, the world changes. Now, remember, the world is not going, as I said in another show, and Fotha said to me, the world is not set up, the world we have here, to make a recovery completely. And Okay, we're fine. We're just doing everything's great. We have paradise here right in front of us. No, this world is going to break down. The rocks and the trees and the soil and the old consciousness is held in those parts is going away. But because we have to leave the world system one and get into the world system too, so we can operate on that higher frequency. It just, that's just how it is. You know, death and taxes, it's surety. That's what's going to happen. But doing it, there's a bad way to do it, and there's a good way to do it, and there's some in between. So we don't want to do it the bad way because we may not get there for a very long time, and there's even a chance that the whole world just destructs and doesn't get, the souls don't get to go through very little chance of that. But there is a chance if we just completely, you know, left the field, you know, turned out loose to the steering wheel and just went, well, take me, you know, we've got to hold on to that steering wheel, not in some kind of will trying to make something happen. But kind of like, you know, when, when uh, Shirley MacLaine, I don't know if you read Out on a Limb, I read it years ago, Shirley MacLaine was in that car and it was she driving or the other guy and all of a sudden the car just started driving itself, but he had to hold on to the steering wheel. And I thought that was important. Because the energy between the person drive, the person holding onto the steering wheel and the true higher experience that's driving the car has to make that connection. You turn loose the steering wheel and go, ah, and you're done for. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I love I that analogy. Yeah, that, that really works for me, you know, because I think a lot of us have felt that. You know, we, we pray to be guided, we're tuning into our intuition, we're meditating, trying to improve our intuition. And you take a step, does this feel right? Oops, I'm in a crisis. Oh, guide me, guide me, guide me. Whoa. And suddenly, you know, because you were sufficiently in tune, you were able to receive the guidance to know, take a sharp left now, this moment. You know, and yes. suddenly you do something that, saves your life or the lives of, of someone else or has some huge influence in the course of your life because you didn't do this. Yes, exactly. You, and as you're speaking, guide me. I'm getting a, a picture from Fo, and he's showing, was it Netflix? Which one had the feather of Mott? Of course, that's who he was. Mott, you know, the feather of Mott on the scale? And he's showing that feather dropping on the scale. And as he does that, it's like everything will be recorded, everything is recorded in the Kasha, but he's saying everything is going to be recorded in the heart of God, that's the way he's putting it. And when that feather drops, you better be ready. And it sounds like I'm a reborn Christian, <laughs> but it's not about you know believing in a certain religion or anything. It's just about now is the time, the feather's dropping and all will be counted, every lamb, every sheep, Every black sheep, every white sheep, every pink sheep, <laughs> it's all going to be counted. And there's no wrathful God that's going to step in. We're talking about science. Science is going to say, well, where does the balance lie? What needs to fall away and what needs to be lifted up? It's just science. And science comes out of the eyes and the heart of what we call God. Well, that feels like a very good place to to end. And we have a, a very brief um, video following this, sharing about Maya sessions. If you would like to have an Akashic reading, a session uh, with Maya, wonderful experience, very much recommended. And of course, please like and subscribe and share and donate if you can. We've got a donation link for... Um, for Sage, um, which is, you know, the organization behind Blue Star Rising. And anything else you wanted to say, Maya? Keep smiling. <laughs> Keep smiling. Smile though your heart is aching, right? Yeah. All right, so thank you all um, for, for being with us. We'll see you next time. God bless us, everyone. Goddess bless us, everyone. Lots of love. Bye for now.